people who are heartbroken and people whose lives have been destroyed turn to the church for solace and for comfort and for help and for redemption as they should other times they come to the church after their marriage had ended in divorce and maybe they've been remarried even for a period of years and one thing that those polls did not take into account was whether the divorce and remarriage took place before faith or after faith before they'd come into the church or after they'd come into the church and there is a difference but I want to tell you what concerns me as I have traveled doing this now for more years than probably I should for my age, oftentimes I'll go back to an area where I had preached a camp four or five years earlier. And I will ask about a particular couple. It may, Brother Tom, even be one of the ministers in that camp meeting. Someone who I'd met. Someone who I had fellowship with and love. And, and I say, where are they this camp meeting? And they will shake their head and say, well, don't you know? And they will tell me some tale of infidelity or immorality and, and the fact that that marriage has now ended in divorce. And I want to tell you that just because you have a Christian home is no guarantee that your marriage will not end in divorce. In fact, I believe that the devil takes more pride in destroying a Christian home than any other home. Now, I want to say this up front. I know that we're always hesitant to preach a message like I want to share with you tonight. I want you to understand that the church has a balancing act that it must walk. Because I do recognize there was a time in the holiness movement when we almost painted divorce and remarriage as the unpardonable sin. And we have to be redemptive. People that are hurting need to know that there is forgiveness and there is redemption and the church must be a redemptive agency. But on the same token, what worries me is there's a generation growing up behind us where it almost as is as if they see marriage as some multiple choice game and if they don't get the right one the first time, they can always try again and again. And so the church must balance this situation where we are redemptive on the one hand and yet teach a new generation that God's choice is one man, one woman forever. That's God's will. And therefore it is so important that we find the right spouse, that one that God wants us to have so that we can develop a godly Christian home. I want to tell you, we can talk about the church all we want. The church needs revival. I will grant that. But I'm convinced that the real need of revival in America does not begin with the church. It begins with the home. Our churches are no more spiritual than our homes. Our churches are no godlier than our homes. They are no more solid than our homes. And in fact, I believe that marriage is the most sacred institution in the world. I believe the home is the most sacred institution. Now someone would say, now wait a minute preacher, the church is the most sacred institution. Well, I believe in the church, but God established the home long before He established the church. And even in the New Testament where so much is written about the church, did you know that the New Testament has more to say about the family than it does the church? Come on. And if we are to really experience revival in our nation, we somehow have to save the home. Somehow, if we are to have revival in our churches, we must have revival in our families. What will it take? What will it mean? Well, I'm going to tell you this is not an expositional message tonight. I prefer preaching expositorially. But I just want to share with you tonight a few things that God gave me that night. I'm just going to talk to you from my heart and tell you what I believe it's going to take if we're to have revival in our home and save our homes. Number one, we need grandparents 
who will model the faith. We need grandparents who will model the faith. I hope you caught it in my text. There is an obligation not only to teach our children, but to teach our children's children. In fact, I have come to believe that in many ways, probably the greatest influence in the world is the influence of godly grandparents. I don't know why it is. I don't know if my co-workers have, have noticed this or have experienced it. But oftentimes I see people in their 30s who were raised in the church, who had a wayward time throughout their teens and their 20s, and now in their mid-30s as their family begins to grow, all of a sudden they come back to camp meeting or they come back to church and they seek God. And oftentimes when I deal with them, when I'm praying with them at the altar, I, say, I ask them, what is it that drew you back? What is it that now has brought you back to the faith of your childhood? And I think more than any other answer that I ever hear, it's this. It was the faith of my grandparents. I wanted my children to know God like Grandpa knew God. Or like Grandma knew God. And what's striking about it is oftentimes these are young adults who have Christian parents as well. Times it's made me wonder, well why is it they cite Grandma and Grandpa before they cite Mom or Dad? Now that I'm a grandparent, I think I understand it. I used to make fun of old people. I mean, you know, they'd get out their pictures of their grandkids. You know, and boy, here, here we'd go. And, and I'd hear him say something like this. I used to think it was the stupidest thing. If I had known grandkids were going to be so much fun, I'd have had them first. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, if I'd have known grandkids were much, so much fun, I'm not even sure I'd have had kids. <laughs> I'd have just had grandkids. But I have discovered why we had the kids. The only reason we ever have children is so we have somewhere to send the grandkids when they start getting on our nerves. <laughs> See, I love my grandkids. I spoil them rotten. In fact, little Emily, the kids from the school know her. Their mom and dad's there at school. Little Emily's too. My little granddaughter. And the other day, you know, they were wanting something. She was really wanting something from Walmart. And mom had already told her no about four or five times. And finally she turned to her four-year-old brother and said, Huh, Papa will get it for me. <laughs> so I did. <laughs> you, know, I, you know how it is with grandkids. But what I've come to recognize is this. We have an opportunity to influence our grandchildren in some ways that go beyond even what mom or dad can do. You see, I thank God. All three of my children are serving the Lord. They all have a great relationship with God. I'm grateful for that. But sometimes, I'll be honest, I think it was in spite of me more than because of me. My daughters know me in a way that none of you will ever know me. They've not only seen me on a camp meeting platform. They've seen me when things weren't going so well. They've seen me when boards didn't act just like boards ought to act. Or pastors didn't act just like pastors ought to act. They have seen me at my worst. And I'll be honest, more times than one, I've had to go to them and say, you know, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have reacted. Or I've been too free to express things around the dinner table that later on I regretted. I'm not perfect. And my children know me at my best and at my worst. And so I have to thank God that in spite of all that, they're serving God and in the church and try to tell me that I did a pretty good job. I know better and so do they. But they've seen me in every situation. On the other hand, it's not been so long ago. My daughter called me one night. I just got back in the office. I'd had to deal with a pastor in a particular situation in a church. And the pastor was so angry with me that he stopped out of the restaurant in the middle of the meal. I mean, he told me off and he just stopped out. He wouldn't even let me finish. I went home. I was really frustrated. And I just trying to calm down at home after this meeting and my oldest daughter called and said, Dad, Preston wants to come over and spend the night with you. He really